In the last episode, we got the rear of the car lifted into the air and took a good look at the exhaust. We decided to replace all the piping behind the catalytic converter. We also started replacing the exhaust hangers, and in the last episode we replaced the one that bolts the transmission. This time we'll get right to work removing the bolts that hold the intermediate pipe to the catalytic converter pipe. There are two bolts that hold this flange together and they both look like they came from a shipwreck. We'll have to use a wrench to hold the bolt still as we remove the nut. But this proved a little easier said than done because of the time the bolts had spent on the ocean's floor. Also, for anyone who's used an impact gun while holding the other side with a wrench, you know how great it feels on your wrist. But eventually, we managed to remove the fastener. And then we got to repeat the same thing on the other side. Hooray! But we got it taken care of, and pretty soon the downpipe was separated from the cat. Since there aren't any hangers on it right now, we'll support the back of the catalytic converter pipe so we're not hanging all that weight off of just the manifolds. There's only one exhaust hanger on the back, and the pipe slides right out of it. Well, it's supposed to. This one took a little bit of extra force, but then it slides right out of it. We'll also go ahead and unbolt that exhaust hanger to take a look at it, even though we don't have a replacement. Since there's no muffler or tailpipes to worry about, the pipe is completely disconnected. The trick now is that we have to get the exhaust pipe over the rear axle. If the car was on a lift, this wouldn't be that big of a deal. But since the exhaust is pressed against the floor, this presents some challenges. To get a little bit more wiggle room, we ended up unbolting this brace that goes down to the track bar bracket. The easiest way to remove the exhaust pipe would be to cut it into pieces and remove it that way. The problem with that approach is that since we're replacing this pipe with a basically identical one, that removal approach wouldn't really be applicable to the new one that we'd like to leave in one piece. So basically, we have to find some sort of route to get this tailpipe over the rear axle. And we also unbolted this heat shield doohickey that sits above the muffler. It still wasn't quite there, so we actually completely took off this support by removing this through bolt. The heat shield and that support brace were both very easy to remove, and after doing so we were pretty close to getting the exhaust over the axle. But close is still not quite there. In order to get the pipe out, we needed to lift the rear of the car even more. And here's where the disclaimers come in. It's really not a good idea to lift a car this unevenly. By leaving the front of the car on the ground and just lifting from the back, we're creating some non-ideal angles. And on top of that, since the jack only goes up so high, we're using a few pieces of wood on top of it. So we're working with a double no-no. We also can't lift it from the differential cover flange like I usually do since on these cars the sway bar actually comes down below the differential housing at full droop. So we'll lift it from the flat bottom of the housing and unfortunately we need to use a few wood blocks to get it high enough. I've seen some people make basically a cradle that sits underneath the jack so that you can lift it up without using blocks like this. I would feel more comfortable with something like that and it would be a fun build for the future. But with a lot of care taken, this unadvisable method worked this time. Then we'll set the car back down on jack stands and let the axle come all the way down. And once we're confident that the car is secure, we'll have another go at removing the intermediate pipe. And after a few more tries with no success, we unbolted the track bar from the body to get a little more clearance. Even after all that, it still took a few minutes to find just the right angle to get it over the axle, but eventually we managed it. That was way more time consuming and annoying than it should have been. But at least it's done, and we should have a clear path to reinstall the new pipe as well. And speaking of the new pipe, let's take a look at it and make sure it'll fit. It's definitely a proper replacement for the pipe we just took off, so I suppose it's time to address why we're leaving this exhaust so restricted. At this point, it was difficult to spare that kind of money, and the car was still so untested, I didn't want to put the time, money, and effort into it to build a full custom exhaust. As mentioned in previous videos, for now, I want to keep the car fairly original. Though, not original as in restoring this car, because that's not really what's happening either. Even though it's almost definitely costing a few horsepower, this exhaust worked just fine on that car for over 150,000 miles, so it will work just fine for a while longer. For the time being, what I want out of this car is for it to be a nice cruiser that just runs and drives and isn't too loud or drony. Which brings us to our choice of new muffler. This is a Thrush Hush, which, as the name suggests, is a pretty quiet model. Between the Blazer and my other Firebird being fairly loud, I thought it would be nice to have a quiet car for once. Don't get me wrong, I definitely love the sound of a V8, but it would also be nice to be able to hear the radio without permanent hearing damage. Nobody is saying this exhaust is going to be on the car forever, but it's what we'll be trying out first. This will help us get the car on the road quickly and cheaply, and then we can decide what we want to do from there. But that's enough about that, let's get back to work. 
The ball flange on the front of this pipe has a few dings in it, probably from shipping. We'll have to clean that up before we install it. Basically, we just bent it back by hand with pliers and kind of filed off the sharp edges. The flange surface on the cat is, shall we say, pitiful, but at least the catalytic converter element itself looks like it's in very good shape. Not only will Mother Nature appreciate the catalytic converter, it will definitely be nice not having a car that stinks up the place. We cleaned up that rusty flange a little bit with sandpaper, but there's only so much that's gonna happen. Long term, it's definitely going to finish rusting through and we'll have some leaks, but hopefully this will last us a while. So now we'll feed that new exhaust pipe under the car and finagle it over the top of the rear axle. Since the car was already in the right position for it, and we kinda sorta remembered how we got the other pipe off, it didn't take long to get this one into place. For the rear of the intermediate pipe, we're just going to reuse the old exhaust hanger. The rubber appears to be in decent shape, and it has a steel clamshell housing, so even if the rubber failed, it wouldn't fall apart. But even that had an issue. The old exhaust pipe had a stamped steel hanger that fit much tighter. The new one just uses a piece of bent steel rod, which fits a bit loosely. So we just stuck a piece of rubber in there and zip-tied it in. If we ever notice the exhaust is a little bit loose, that's probably the culprit. We'll also bolt up the front exhaust hanger to the catalytic converter. This one is pretty straightforward. We'll just line up the bolt holes with one of the holes on the flange and install a new bolt and nut. There are two holes on the exhaust hanger and two holes on the flange, but it doesn't quite seem like the lower one wants to line up. So instead of putting a lot of force on these rusty parts to hold things together, we'll leave it with just the one bolt. And with that hanging in a neutral position, we'll tighten up that bolt and nut. Once the rubber hanger has stretched a little bit, I might try to come back and install that second bolt, but I don't think it'll matter too much either way. Next, before we try to test fit our new muffler on the car, let's take a look at the old one and its tailpipes. That means dragging it out of the back seat. I was too cheap to get a tailpipe for the new muffler, so we'll be reusing one of these. Unfortunately, I hadn't looked at these ahead of time, and they're kind of rusty. That surprises nobody. We'll try to take off the tailpipes by simply undoing the U-bolts. We'll just put the impact on there and whether it undoes the nut or snaps it off, we should be okay either way. Yikes. It seems like this thing was held on exclusively with flakes of rust. I sure hope nobody watching at home is breathing in any of this. But despite the mess, it did come apart and we can just remove the U-bolt. So how about the other tailpipe? It'd be nice to get the other side off, but this is the side that we will be using with the new muffler. This factory muffler is a single in dual out, but the new muffler only has one outlet. So we'll have to live with a single tailpipe for now. At least that makes this process a little easier. Interestingly, this U-bolt, while appearing less rusty, snapped right off. The nut on the other side put up a fight, but gave up more easily after seeing what happened to his fallen brother. So the U-bolts have been removed. The issue is the rust and the not insignificant clamping pressure that they had used to hold the pipes together. We managed to get the passenger side pipe to rotate, but that was about it. In the end, we gave up and just decided to cut the passenger side tailpipe out of the muffler. This way we don't have to deal with the part of the pipe that was deformed by the clamp, and the outboard side isn't actually too rusty. However, that bend in the pipe has a few holes, as clearly demonstrated by the grinding sparks. That's a bit of an unforeseen issue, but we can take care of that. And after a little bit more cutting, we have the pipe completely separated. Since the new muffler isn't as long as the old one, and since we had to cut a bit of the other tailpipe off, we're gonna need all the pipe we can get. This straight piece from the other tailpipe looks to be in good shape, so we'll go ahead and steal that. We also need to deal with the completely torn exhaust hanger on the driver's side. Removing the part from the body of the car was easy enough. It's simply held on by two bolts. As for the side of the exhaust hanger that's attached to the tailpipe, we'll have to get that loose too. We'll put a wrench on the bolt and turn the nut with the impact gun. On the second try, the wrench stays in place, but we have to chase the pipe around like a wounded animal, and the bolt snaps off. So here's the old exhaust hanger up next to the one that's replacing it. It seems like they match up, so I think we have the right part. So now we can install our replacement hanger. This new part is the same style as the old one, so it bolts right up. We'll put a bolt through the straps of our hanger and attach it to our tailpipe. We'll just install it loosely for now so that we can test fit our parts. 
The tailpipe being suspended and mounted about where we want it should help a lot. And we'll also get the downpipe into place by bolting it up to the catalytic converter. We'll get everything lined up and then thread in the two bolts. This is just a temporary install, so we'll get the bolts just tight enough that the flange is fully seated, but leave it loose so that we can still move it around a bit. So this is where everything is sitting right now. Let's see if we can bridge that gap with our new muffler. This muffler is two and a quarter inches on both sides, so it slips right over the downpipe. And with that held in place, we can see approximately where the tailpipe needs to line up. It doesn't quite reach, and there's a little bit of a funny angle, so we will need that extra piece of pipe we cut out. We'll get a measurement for that gap we need to fill and cut the pipe to match it. We're also cutting the pipe at a slight angle since it's not quite a straight shot from the outlet of the muffler to the tailpipe. And now we'll go for another test fit. This time we're holding up the muffler with the jack so that it stays relatively still. We've also flipped the muffler around so that the centered side is the outlet. Some mufflers are only really designed for flow in one direction, but this model is reversible, which makes it a little bit more flexible. We have the pipes about where we want them, but we have to make sure that heat shield will still fit above the muffler where it's sitting right now. There's at least half an inch of space above it, and once everything is sitting on the hangers, it'll drop a little bit lower, so it should be fine. We'll go ahead and put the ground clamp for the welder up there, and line up the pipes the way we want them. You might notice a slight oversight in that placement of the clamp, but we'll get back to that in a second. This isn't the easiest angle to do this from, but we'll put a few tack welds on each of the pipes to hold them in place. Immediately after doing this, I noticed that the clamp doesn't actually open as wide as I thought it did, and is kind of stuck on the exhaust now. But that's the nice thing about just doing tack welds before fully welding something. So now that we won't be surrendering the ground clamp to the exhaust system, we can tack everything in place again. And once the pipes are secure, we can remove the bolt from the hanger and slide the muffler off of the intermediate pipe. And before we do anything else, to make sure I don't forget, we'll reinstall the heat shield that sits above the muffler. It's held to the body with a few small sheet metal screws. Then we'll reinstall the brace for the track bar bracket. A little earlier, we had already installed the through bolt for the track bar itself. Both of those bracket through bolts get a little bit of anti-seize, as do the three bolts that hold the brace to the body. We'll also reinstall the other two screws that hold the heat shield to that brace. Once they're all snugged down, we'll tighten the three brace to body bolts to 34 foot-pounds. Both of the bolts that go through the track bar bracket get tightened down to 58 foot-pounds. Because of the rubber bushing in it, the track bar bolt really should be tightened down with the suspension at ride height, but in this case, they're old bushings that I'll probably replace anyway, and we're not too worried about it. And now we're going to take a little bit of a detour from the exhaust, because this is something I would like to take care of before the muffler is in place. While the car is up in the air and we have a little bit of extra space with the muffler out of the way, we'll go ahead and change the differential fluid. Before attempting to remove the cover and drain it, we're going to make sure this filler plug is going to move. It's pretty rusty and we have to hammer in the 3 8 inch socket to make it fit. But it comes out with only a few taps from the impact wrench, so it seems like everything is in order. It also seems like there's a decent amount of oil in there, so hopefully the diff is in good shape. And now we'll go around and remove the 10 bolts that hold the cover to the differential housing. This probably would have been a little easier if we left the track bar loose, but oh well. We get to all the bolts without an issue, and pretty soon we can pull the cover loose. Of course, we want to have a drain pan ready before we remove a single bolt, but in this case the cover stayed glued on pretty well even once they were all removed. That gear oil is looking pretty black, so I'm guessing it's more than a few years old. But it's not chunky, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of metal in it, so the differential should still be in good shape. And once most of the oil has dripped out, we'll go ahead and remove that cover. What makes things easier is that our cover is a special edition with a self-removing feature. Taking a peek beneath the cover confirms all suspicions that this is indeed an open differential. A limited slip might be fun somewhere down the line, but today we're just changing out the oil. All the teeth appear to be in good shape, and there are no signs of abnormal wear patterns. The ring gear is marked 15 to 41, which confirms that this is a 2.73 to 1 rear end. These gears definitely have miles on them, but again, they seem to be in good shape. The pinion also looks good, and the backlash doesn't feel excessive. We'll go ahead and use a razor blade to clean up the leftovers of RTV that we're holding on that cover. Of course, we have to be careful not to scratch the surface, but we want to make it as clean as possible. Luckily, everything cleans up without too much effort. We'll also clean up the case cover in the same way. The magnet does have some steel filings on it, but that's nothing abnormal for a high mileage unit, especially one that hasn't had the oil changed in a while. 
We'll scrape all the surfaces clean and get as many of the shavings off of the magnet as possible. We'll also try to wipe out some of the old oil from the bottom of the case and spray everything down with brake clean. Then we'll reinstall a cover with the new gasket. I must admit, this is the first time I've ever used a pre-made gasket for one of these differentials. Usually I just use RTV. But when ordering all the extra parts, this gasket was less than a dollar, so I figured I'd give these a try. It's a fiber gasket, and we sprayed it with a bit of WD-40 when installing to help ensure that it comes off easily in the future. We'll also reinstall the differential bolts with a little bit of anti-seize on each. And once they're all installed, we'll go around and snug them all down in a crisscross pattern. Then we'll go around and in a few steps, tighten each of the bolts down to 20 foot-pounds. Using a crisscross pattern and tightening down the bolts in multiple steps helps ensure even torque and prevents warping the cover. And once the cover is back on, we'll remove the fill plug and add the gear oil. We're just using a standard ADW90 oil and the differential holds around 1.8 quarts. There's enough space around the fill hole that we're able to fill it just using the gear oil bottles. And pretty soon a little bit of oil drips out of the fill hole, which means the differential is full. We can peek inside the differential and confirm this. It's actually a bit overfilled, especially since the car is tilted forward, but it should be okay. We'll go ahead and reinstall the fill plug and tighten it to 20 foot-pounds. We'll also try to clean up some of the oil on the outside of the case so that it'll be a little more obvious if it starts to leak. So now we've got an axle full of fresh oil and we can get back to working on the exhaust. We have the exhaust pipes tacked together where we want them, so we'll give them a few more small welds around the perimeter to make sure nothing moves, and then we'll fully weld them together. At this point, I would recommend that any professional welders or exhaust builders or people watching this video in any resolution above 240p probably look away for a little while. We're using our trusty Harbor Freight welder and 030 flux core wire on surfaces that really haven't been prepped at all. This is the 170 amp welder, and it doesn't love the low settings, so with flux core wire it can be a little tough to do thin materials. But as usual, we'll soldier through and just keep doing a little bit at a time and jumping around to keep from getting parts too hot. The part fitment also isn't amazing, and there are some decent gaps to fill in. But the holes in the bend are a little bit too much. For those, we're gonna go full on cheapskate Frankenstein and just slap a piece of steel over them. This is a piece of leftover 16 gauge sheet that we cut out of the barrel when we were making a drum smoker earlier in the summer. We'll clamp it in the vise and just kinda eyeball it and give it a nice little curve until it seems like it fits around that corner nicely. We're certainly not winning any metalworking competitions here, but I think it'll be just fine to patch that hole. We'll pop that into place on that curve and confirm that it fits pretty well. To get it as close to the surface as possible, we'll do a little bit of massaging and then start tack welding it. Once the parts that fit well are held into place, we'll keep going around and hammering it flush and tack welding it as we go. We'll repeat this a few times until we've gone all the way around the patch and it's fitting pretty well. And to hold the last little edge in place, we'll just hold it with channel lock pliers and try not to weld them to the pipe. And now that the fitment is pretty good and it's all held into place, we'll go around and fully weld it. For this portion of the video, I recommend switching the quality to 144p for the best possible viewing experience. If that option isn't available for you, I recommend sitting at least 30 to 40 feet away from your screen. Actually, wait, I think I can help. Here, let's just, let's just do this. Oh yeah, yeah, there we go. Now we can finish fully welding the exhaust before we take it to a local welding competition where we will surely win first prize. And once the welding is all finished and we've come back from the competition with our gold star for participation, we'll go ahead and give the tailpipe a coat of paint. The paint we're using is a high temp silver barbecue paint, which is a pretty good match for the color the muffler already is and I've used before with good success. We'll give the pipe three coats of paint and then flip it over and do the other side. In hindsight, it's kind of funny how many people have asked me to paint the parts that I remove, and here I am painting this heap that I don't think anybody wanted in the car to begin with. But even if it's a bit ugly, at least it's shiny now. We'll give the paint some time to dry and then get ready to bolt it onto the car. We'll slip the muffler back onto the intermediate pipe and then raise up the jack to hold everything in place while we get the tailpipe hanger installed. Once everything is about where it needs to be, we'll reinstall the bolt for that exhaust hanger and hold it in place with the lock nut. And with the exhaust supported on both sides, we can lower the jack. Then we'll tighten down the hanger bolt. We want to make sure it's tight, but doesn't completely crush the rubber. And with that held in place, we can start to align the tailpipe. But we'll need to tighten the intermediate shaft to the cat before we can set that angle for good. But before doing that, I'd like to increase the odds of this flange actually sealing. What we'll do is remove the bolts again and separate the two parts. Then we'll lightly sand both sides and clean them up with some brake clean. 
To help this flange seal, we're going to apply some copper RTV. This should help fill in the gaps on that uneven rusty surface. This far down the exhaust stream, parts don't really get that hot, so the heat rating of copper RTV is a bit overkill, but that's never stopped us before. We'll apply a bead of it to the intermediate pipe side of the flange, and then we'll spread it around a little bit to cover the whole flange surface. It's worth noting that the off-gassing of most types of RTV can damage oxygen sensors, but since this car doesn't have one behind the catalytic converter, it should be just fine. We'll let the silicone sit for a minute and then reattach the pipes. Both bolts will be installed finger tight and then tightened down a bit. We just want to get it tight enough so that the pipe won't shift around anymore. We'll come back and tighten them down for good in about half an hour when the silicone has had more time to set. And now we'll decide on the position of the tailpipe. The best way to do this would be to set the car on the ground and decide how you want it to look, but I think we can get it close enough to be happy with it. We want to angle the pipe far down enough that exhaust gas doesn't build up in the bumper area, and far up enough that it's not dragging on the ground or dumping the exhaust straight under the car. Once we're happy with that, and there's enough space around all the components that nothing's going to rattle around, we'll use a U-bolt to clamp the muffler onto the intermediate pipe. We're going to be reusing one of the clamps that we took off the old muffler. If you look at the downpipe, you can see that we marked the length of it with a sharpie. This helps us ensure that the pipe is inserted far enough into the muffler so that when we clamp it down, we're not just crushing the end of it. The mark we just made on the muffler is where the end of the pipe is sitting, so we'll place the clamp around halfway between that mark and the end of the muffler slip pipe. We'll reassemble the clamp using anti-seize and new nuts and washers to help make sure it'll come apart in the future. We'll tighten the two sides of the U-bolt evenly, and a little bit at a time. We'll keep checking to see if the muffler will still rotate on that pipe. Trying to move it using the end of the tailpipe gives us the most leverage. Once we get to the point where the parts don't seem like they want to move anymore, we'll give each of the fasteners about another turn. The idea is to get it tight enough so that the parts don't move, but keep it loose enough that we don't crush the pipes onto each other and make them impossible to separate in the future. And we'll give it one final shake test to confirm that everything is tight. And finally, we'll come back to tighten the bolts at the front of the intermediate pipe. We'll tighten each side in even amounts until we can see the flange start to flex a little bit. I didn't see a torque spec for these bolts, but they should probably be somewhere around 30 foot-pounds. Just like with the exhaust clamp U-bolt, we're reusing the original bolts, but we've added anti-seize and have new nuts and washers. And with that tight, the exhaust flange is fully seated on the cat and we should be good to go. The instructions on the copper RTV suggest a longer cure time than most other types, so we'll give it 24 hours before starting the car. I did also end up welding over that questionable spot on the Y-pipe, but instead of looking at a picture of how that turned out, let's just change the subject. We've reached the end of this episode, and once again, we still didn't have time to remove the rear sway bar end links. That will actually definitely happen in the next episode. Probably. And we'll also finally excavate the interior of the car. But right now, we're gonna jump ahead in time a little bit so that we can hear what the exhaust sounds like. <laughs> It does sound okay at higher RPMs, as we'll hear in future videos, it's just pretty quiet. But, as mentioned before, I'd like to just drive the car for a while and see how I feel about the exhaust. Sooner or later, we'll probably replace the exhaust and eventually probably replace the whole system. But, for now, this will do the job. And even though it's not necessarily the normal sound you'd expect to hear out of something like this, it is nice to not worry about waking up the neighbors when driving down the street late at night. 